Good morning, everybody. We're going to start off in 1 Timothy 6, so if you want to open up to that, we'll stay in 1 Timothy 6 for the majority of this class. We will bounce around some other places. I promise you we will not find ourselves in Song of Solomon, but anywhere else is up for grabs this morning as we discuss this. As I mentioned, this class is designed to be taken thematically, so last week we talked about 1 Timothy 1, a little bit into 2, a little bit into 4. This week will almost be exclusively into 1 Timothy 6, and that's pretty much where we'll stay, as I mentioned, except for when we bounce around a little bit. But before we go ahead and get started, I'm going to ask Kyle if he doesn't mind to lead us in a word of prayer. Amen. Thank you. Last week, if you remember, we discussed Paul's teachings to Timothy about identifying the gospel. What is the pure gospel? What is not? The issues pertaining to that. How would you define the gospel if somebody asked you, what is the gospel? That's four times I've said the word gospel, so it should be really in our brains at this point. How would you define the gospel? The power of God. Okay, that's true. The power of God to salvation. Yeah, that's okay. So that is actually one of the faithful sayings, I think, inside of First and Second Timothy. So good call on that one. Or that's Romans 1. Sorry, my brain went somewhere else. How else would you define the gospel? Show? Yeah, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, that seems to be the way Paul kind of centers it. If you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he talks about how I desire to know nothing except Jesus Christ and crucified. We'll circle back on that here in just a second. How else would you define the gospel? That's true, too, yes. I'm getting it great from the wings here. It is, it is the good news, but what do you mean by that? I think that's true, and, and there are some people that would define the gospel in terms of kind of a proactive solution. They would say, these are things we need to do, these are things that we have to kind of define our life by, and I don't disagree with that, but when we talk about bringing the good news to other people, I think it kind of more centers around what Shell talked about, which is just simply the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, kind of talking about the fact that Jesus is Lord, the fact that he was risen, that to me is, I think, what he talks about when he says good news. If you look back at First Timothy chapter 4, two chapters earlier than probably where you're at right now, you look in verse 16, he says, By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness, which I think is kind of in a nutshell what the gospel is all about. It says, He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, taken up, taken, I'm sorry, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. It's a very simplistic and a very narrow understanding of the gospel. Why is it that Paul seems to so narrowly define the gospel? Because we, if we had said, how would you define the gospel, that could have been the whole class, 45 minutes of just people talking about it. Why do you think he defines it so narrowly? That was going to be my next statement after that, which is it is very simple, and then people tend to complicate it. I do agree with that. Why else do you think he makes it so narrow? Right. If you remove all of, and I don't want to say periphery information, because there's no periphery information when it comes to the gospel, but when you remove everything else, the central core tenets of it is what he talked about here in First Timothy chapter 4. The rest of it is kind of up for debate, at least in some people's minds. People like to argue about this, people like to argue about that. And that, I think, creates quite a bit of consternation um, amongst people. Why is it that people like to debate the idea of the gospel, these periphery types of statements, that type of thing? Because this is a real danger if you reread 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is kind of where Paul's focus is. Why is it that people like to debate those things? Everything else pertaining to the gospel. Self-justification. I'm already on this path, and I would like to kind of reinforce the fact that I am right on this path. Yeah? Ironically, this is where we can debate this. Why would people debate these points? Yeah. 
I'm basically saying anything besides what he mentions in 1 Timothy 4, which is the idea of Jesus coming to the earth, dying, resurrecting, that kind of thing. Anything besides that seems like people like to argue about. Right. Right. It does, it does seem like it always, and once again, every time we talk about sin, there's always a mention of pride. I don't think you can talk about sin without talking about pride. So it does kind of reinsert itself into the situation. I think some of it comes back to power, which is kind of pride adjacent. I want to amass power for myself. Yeah, Lee? I think it does. I think if people, and this is probably where the Judaizing teachers were more going towards, at least subconsciously in their minds, was if I can deviate from this and point them to what I'm actually focused on, which is circumcision, obeying at least part of the law, if I can focus them on that, then it becomes what's already important to me. And so we kind of become gospel deviated, which this is important, but everything else is much more important. And so I do think it distracts from a lot of those things, too. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments on that? Ken? Right. Right. To be fair, the angels, as talked about there in first, I think you're thinking First Peter chapter one, they wanted to know before how salvation was going to work. Afterwards, I don't know if there was debate about it, but certainly before they wanted. Right. How is God going to redeem the world? That kind of thing. Yeah, for sure, Lee. Right. 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 Yeah, and to the Jews, the Hebrews would have the Hebrew letter was a great testament to that kind of idea, which is all the things that you're looking for in the Old Testament, things that you understand, they find their fulfillment in Jesus. That's a great letter for that purposes. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed, but one of the things I like to do is take what people say and then manipulate it so it's completely different. So just one of my many tendencies. Let me ask you this question as we're jumping into 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says basically in this chapter, all of it top to bottom, is in some form related to greed. Why is it that he cautions Timothy and eventually Titus about greediness? Why do preachers need to be worried about greediness? And in case you're wondering, yes, I did wear a bulletproof vest, so go after it. Why do preachers need to be worried about greediness? And you can say it. I'm not going to be hurt by it. Are you asking me that? Or, okay. Well, my motivation is to teach. But you're right. I think it is important to ask why people are even in this industry to begin with. Yeah. This is going to be a really awkward class moving forward. At least today. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, so first off, thank you for just kind of staying within First Timothy. I was really worried that this was going to go off the rails, but I think as he talks about First Timothy chapter 6, the core concern is, is that out of a desire to be popular, to be rich, or to be whatever it is, or at least just to remain not unpopular, if that makes any sense, sometimes the temptation is to skew the gospel and say, well, I'm only going to preach on this, I'm only talk about this, I'm only talk about this. And that's one of the reasons why Paul in Acts chapter 20 says that I did not shun to declare to you the whole gospel of God. He emphasizes that point and then kind of makes that a point for the elders moving forward. That is a danger for these people, and it's not just a danger for them. How is greediness an issue for all of us as Christians, specifically as Christians? I feel like I don't know if you're asking me these questions. It feels somewhat personal, but... I do think that's a good question. I mean, you could also look at Hebrews chapter 11, you know, Esau who sold his birthright for a pot of stew. I mean, how eager are you to exchange your inheritance for something that's not eternal? I think that's a great question. It changes your focus. It focuses on an object or acquiring something. Right. And it doesn't even really have to be an object. It can be some kind of status or it can be something. Yeah. Colossians 3 and verse 5 talks about greediness as being an idol. It can be a, a, similar to idolatry. And I think you can see that in this chapter. Levi? Yeah. 
correctly right. money or things, material items. But it doesn't have to be that. It could be, I want to be popular. Right. I want to fit in with the people around me. And so, as what has been alluded to, whether you're in a teaching position, which is frankly much worse, because then you can minister to the people. Right. But as an individual Christian, if I if I am so concerned about fitting in with my coworkers, right. the people at the gym or whatever, mm-hmm. then I can change my own actions against what I know the gospel says I should be doing. Right. Right. As you can tell, I'm very interested in what other people think of me at the gym. But you're right in that regard, which is it's very easy to look around you and think to yourself, how is it that I can, how is it that I can attain more of maybe what I already have? You know, I have this position. I want that position. I have this group of friends. I want more of those type of friends. Or I want more money or whatever it is. And you're right that we kind of center it around an object. When in reality, I think the way Paul talks about it is more in terms of status or in terms of popularity or certainly power, I think, always kind of fall, factors back into it at some point. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Yeah, Ray? I think, if, number one, uh, if you become greedy and you're doing it for the money, you're no longer a Christian, you're a politician. But, uh, <laughs> That's true, yeah. The other part of that is it doesn't have to be a monetary thing, it doesn't have to be a car or gold or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I, and you kind of hit on a theme that I think we've touched on in other places, too, that just kind of occurred to me, is we tend to think of greediness in terms of quantity. I want more, 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 more. And I think sometimes when you really boil down greediness, it all comes back to the idea of self. It's what I want. And when I look at this in terms of, of preachers that I know and I've heard of, sometimes it doesn't even just exist in terms of more. I don't want bigger churches. I just want my own church. I want, I want to have a subset of a group. And I want that one to be my people. And then you kind of have this situation in some churches where you have groups going to battle against each other, which is certainly what Paul alludes to here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's something that uh, James talks about in James chapter 3 when he says, as Levi mentioned, let not many of you become teachers because by doing so you incur a stricter judgment. There is a greater danger, as Levi mentioned, in being this position specifically where you're in charge of other people, not in charge of other people. I was thinking of elders when I said that. Any kind of spiritual position where you're public, there is that danger. And I think I see that with a lot of other people. Never see it with myself, obviously, but always with other people. Yeah. It seems like the, that was sarcastic. Hopefully everybody got that. Sorry. It seems like the greediness is closely related to lust. And, in fact, uh, we're told not to lust after the flesh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you see the Right. Yeah. Yeah, greed and lust kind of both fall into that idea of sins of excess. Whatever it is, I want more of it. Whatever it is, I want my part of it. It's just, it's what you have is not enough. And you want to kind of keep gaining more for your own self, not because you're trying to do more good, but because you want more of it, whatever it may be. So I, I do agree with that for sure. Well, and even from, even from a, what we talked about with the, what the core of the gospel is, the core of the gospel is selflessness. Jesus came, he gave, he died, and then he was resurrected and sent into heaven. So the core idea of what it means for Christ's purposes was to give of himself. As he said himself, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. That's, why I hold, that's the whole reason he came. That's what Christianity is all about. And if that's not what we're about as Christians, then I think we need to have some kind of rearrangement of our priorities, no matter what 
your specific position is. Right. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 3. He says, talking once again about false teachers, this is kind of a recurring theme throughout 1 Timothy, and he kind of pivots it hard. If you read the first two verses, he talks about slaves. Verse 3 is a very, very clean break. In my opinion, that's where the, the chapter division should have been. He says, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and doesn't agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions, disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abuse of language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. How hard does Paul come down on false teachers in those verses? And this is not even the most dramatic thing he'll say about them in this epistle, if you can believe it. He does come down very hard. I, right. He is proud. Yeah. We know where that leads. Mm-hmm. You know, I like to know nothing. Right. Know anything. Yeah. All they're there to do is the rest of the talk about just throw stuff out there and cause arguments and strife. Right. I think what, it, obviously, Paul is not going to be friends of false teachers. I don't think there's any question of that. I think the things he says are very noteworthy. For instance, he says there in verse 4, um, he says these are people who are conceited, which is obviously arrogance that goes with false teachers, but also that they understand nothing, that they don't really have any actual knowledge or wisdom amongst themselves. But also, if you look right after that, he says he has a morbid interest. Some translations would render that, I think, peculiar. But he says he has just kind of this weird interest in controversial questions. Have you ever met people like that that just really, for whatever reason, just really enjoy analyzing things from a weird perspective? Like, I just want to cause friction. That's just who I am. I think all of us probably have met people like that. This takes it particularly in a, or specifically in a spiritual mindset. But then he goes on about this. He says these morbid questions, these controversial questions, these morbid interests, produces a whole bunch of other things. What, what do these things produce there in verses 3 through 5? Specifically there in verse 5. Well, they're deprived minds, which once again is not a Calvinistic thing. It's just these are people who have taken what God has given them and have taken it selfishly. That's their own will that they did that. Yeah, constant friction, which I can't think of a better word for it. You have this constant friction, but out of which arise what right before that? Right. Abusive language. I think you mentioned that too. This is what this is what these controversial questions do. And so when we talk about the idea of retaining sound words, making sure you only focus on the gospel, nothing else besides the gospel, the reason for that is not only because it condemns him, but it can also condemn other people as well. And so I think when you look at what he's talking about this, you have to ask the question ultimately, what is the source of division between churches? I would I bet you probably every person in this room knows of at least one church that is split, and not because of doctrinal lines. What is oftentimes the source of this division? Selfishness. Selfishness. You said that with a thousand-mile stare in your eyes. Yeah. Lust for power, power. yeah. Because he who holds the clicker is the one in charge, obviously. I think that is, though, and I have seen, not to come down on elders, but I have seen that specifically with some elders who, who... not only will lord it over the church, but also lord it over the other elders, where they just kind of want to be the king elder. So, yeah, Ken? <laughs> this is going to be good. I can't wait. It alarms me that you're bringing up these questions. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I, I'm surprised you didn't mention the color of the pews. The color of the pews is the classic example of things that churches divide over. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it too. And it can't just be red because that's the, that's the symbol of blood. It has to be off red. That's that's what we really need to get people in the right mindset. Taking the more, the more generic approach. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And I think what you said there at the end is probably the key to that. Most of these, most churches that I've heard of that divided almost never divide over scriptural things. I mean, it's never like some elder just pops off or some preacher just pops off with some weird belief. It's always 
something that riles somebody up. And then you have, as you mentioned, you have people taking sides, and then you have this kind of point of no return where people just kind of go their own ways. That's the way it kind of happens, and that's what he's talking about here. He is talking about this specifically in a teaching context, and that's why when you back up in verse 3, he says if anyone advocates a different doctrine and doesn't agree with sound words, that's a deliberate choice these people are making. And the choice that they're making, which may seem like a stand for the truth, and that's how all of this is cloaked, that choice that you made to quote-unquote stand for the truth ultimately divides people that are trying to live by the truth. And the collateral damage of that is everybody else inside the church building. And that's a real issue that Paul is addressing here in verses 3 through 5. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? In case you're wondering, he does come back to these people in verse 10. If you look at this in verse 10, he says... For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Some by longing for it, which once again represents that deliberate choice, some by longing for it have wandered away from its, the faith and pierced themselves through with many griefs. If you look at what he says at the very end of this book in verses 20 and 21, he says, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus have gone away from the faith. What does he say about these false teachers in those verses? Dad was about to say, but he, he didn't say anything. So, Paul, you got it. Dad had his mouth open for a couple minutes. That's why I thought he was going to say something. Yeah, Gnosticism, as we mentioned last week, certainly plays into the, the whole essence of the gospel there in 1 Timothy 4. It wasn't as big of a deal, I think, in terms of maybe quantity of people as something like Judaizing teachers would have been, which he does oftentimes talk about as well. Paul oftentimes refers his harshest criticism for Judaizing teachers. John is the one who generally takes the Gnostic slant. But you're right. I mean, whichever way you're talking about it, you've got people that are absolutely emphatic about a position. And depending on who they're around they may amplify that position even more. You have a perfect example of this in Galatians chapter 2. What happened with Peter? Right. Yeah, it seems pretty innocent. I mean, if you just read it casually, it seems, well, what's the big deal with this? Peter is reserving his fellowship only for the Jews as long as the Jews are around. As soon as they're gone, he doesn't mind fellowship with the Gentiles. It's not something I would argue that most of us would have picked up on. I don't know if I would have noticed it necessarily. Paul absolutely saw the danger with that and then launches off on an 11-verse tirade in the end of Galatians chapter 2 to talk about the dangers of that. But it, I think that's really where it begins. It's this kind of subtle shift in attitude where it becomes a little bit less about the gospel and a little bit more about your environment. I think that's what he's addressing here. When you look at what he says in verse 10 and then also in 20 and 21, he talks about how there is a trust that is given to these people, and at some point a choice is made to depart from it. Some of it comes from greed, some of it comes from the, the company that you keep, some of it comes from selfishness, whatever it is. But it, the source of division almost always begins with a me-first attitude, and that's kind of a statement that he would just make at large. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Okay, look back at verse 6. I love how Paul kind of pivots here a little bit. He says in verse 6, Godliness actually is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into this world, so we can take nothing of it out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. That's one of my favorite words in the entire gospel. But those who want to get rich fall into a temptation, a snare, many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And of course, the point has been made. It's not money. It's the love of money. The love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the truth and pierced themselves through with many, gar- with, many, um, with many griefs. That's the problem with closing that page before it was actually done reading. He makes these kind of two counterpoints in verses uh, 5 and then 6. The very first thing he mentions in verse 5 is, is that there are people who suppose that godliness is a means of great gain. I'll ask you a question. You can answer it practically, and you can answer it as a Christian, however you want to. Is, godly- is there gain in godliness? Yes. 
Okay, I'm not there yet, but you are right. Paul is going to expound on that. Because if you stop at verse 5, it almost seems like he's giving no hope whatsoever to anything. But I'm trying to. I'm, I have to. For the purposes of right now, I have to pluck it out. Why does, he, why does he come down hard on people who suppose that godliness is a means of great gain? Because as he says in verse 6, it is a means of great gain, but not the way it's mentioned in verse 5. Why is it, why is it the great gain in verse 5 is wrong? Great gain in verse 6 is fine. Right. I think there is some tendency to talk about this purely in a financial gain, that there are people that just think that this is a, for lack of a better phrase, an easy way to make money, that this is just something they can do. Yeah, Lee? That's true, and that's why Sandra asked me painstakingly, what is my motivation for this? I know she mentioned it at large, but you are right about that. What is your motivation for doing any of these things? Right. I'm just kind of there because I see maybe that this is something I can do, but I don't really in any capacity care about the effects of it. Yeah. Dad? I was going to say that if you read the verse just before that, about seeing it, it says imagine. It's actually talking about the person himself. Uh, how, they, how they look at it. It's not saying that God does this. It's wrong. Right. The person imagine that. That's. Right. That's what I was going for when I asked that question. I did not characterize it in the right way. But there are people who imagine that there is a great gain, physical gain, to be had when it comes to preaching the gospel. And when I mean that, I'm talking about book deals. And I see it specifically with other preachers in terms of how many gospel meetings you have, the size of the congregation that you're a part of. There's all these kind of physical temptations that equate to status that kind of lure some people a certain direction. And I don't think any of us are necessarily not prone to this, maybe in our own careers or whatever it may be. But he's talking about specifically in a spiritual sense that there are certain physical draws that some people have that take them away from what the mission really is all about. Would anybody like to talk about that? Let's look at Philippians chapter 1. Keep your finger in 1 Timothy. It seems to me like Paul's had run-ins with these types of people a couple times. If you look at what he mentions in Philippians chapter 1, for instance... We tend to focus on chapters 3 and 4, and depending on who you're talking to, chapter 2 also. But chapter 1, I think, is really revealing into Paul's psyche. In verse 12 of Philippians chapter 1, he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has actually become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Philippians 1, 12-14, Paul analyzes the situation he's in, and he says, I'm in prison. That's not really a bad thing, though. Why is it not bad that he's in prison? Exactly. We talked about this a little bit, I think, a couple weeks ago when we talked about Acts chapter 22, 24, and 26. There is a new audience of people that he might never have had the opportunity to reach had it not been for his current imprisonment. The Philippian jailer is a perfect example of situations like that. But then he also kind of says there in verse 13 that just the cause of Christ has become well known, specifically through the Praetorian Guard, which is a high-ranking member of Roman soldiers. And that also in verse 14, what's the other benefit of it? Right. Some brethren have looked at my situation, Paul says, and they've actually taken courage from it, knowing that, and I don't mean this flippantly, this is the worst that can happen to you. I mean, Paul is the poster child for Christianity at this point, and if this is the worst that can happen to you, and I'm willing to accept that, then I have more courage to go do what I need to do. Let me ask you this question, though. Is that a normal attitude that anybody else would have towards imprisonment? I don't think so. I don't think this is the, the mindset of most people. I think most people will look at this as being very negative. Paul is able to kind of see the bright side in it. He sees it through a very spiritual lens. 
In verse 15, he flips the script a little bit and starts talking about other people. What's the problem with other preachers? And these are people that the Philippians would have known about. I don't think there's any question of that. Other preachers look at this as an opportunity to do what? What's that? I don't know if martyr or sympathy is the right way. I can see where you're kind of coming at with that. I think that they're looking at it in a much less optimistic or a much less um, condescending type of way. How do other preachers look at it? Verse 15, he says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. Some are also preaching out of goodwill. Exactly. There is a power vacuum that has all of a sudden existed in the industry known as Christianity. And person X is now going to step into the limelight and start to take that from themselves. What he talks about in verse 15 and 16 is he says, some of these people do it out of love. There's a vacancy. There's not as much preaching. not as much teaching is going on. I need to go and fill in what's lacking in Paul's work. That's the right attitude. There are other people in verse um, 17 that do it out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, hoping to cause me distress in my imprisonment. That can either mean that they're taking advantage of the situation for their own personal gain or possibly that they're even adding to why Paul is in prison. Paul is a heretic. Paul's anti-Jew. And maybe they're going to step into the, in the limelight and start to preach against that even more. Paul deserves to be in prison, that kind of thing. Paul's ultimate attitude in verse 18 is what? Once again, it doesn't really matter to me because the thing that matters the most is that Christ is being proclaimed. That's the thing that I care about the most. I think it's a very interesting standpoint that Paul has, and yet it's exactly who he's talking about there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments on that? Look back at 1 Timothy 6. Let's get back to this yes but no kind of statement that Paul makes in verses 5 and 6. In verse 5, he says there are people who imagine that godliness is a means of great gain. This is an opportunity for me to capitalize on my life. This is an opportunity for me to acquire fame for myself, whatever it may be. But then he kind of says in verse 6 that godliness actually is a means of great gain. How is godliness a means of great gain? Yeah, when you, have, when you actually do have a covenant relationship with God, yeah. But what does that covenant relationship with God bring you? Contentment. That's the key word that I'm looking at. That's why I mentioned a second ago as being my favorite word. Why is it that he says godliness is a means of great gain as long as it's accompanied by contentment? What does contentment have to do with anything? Right. Going back to Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, it doesn't really matter what's going on with me because I've learned, as you mentioned, whatever state I am to be content. That's something he had to work towards. It's an effort thing. Why else does Z say that contentment is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment? What is contentment? Right. Flip, going back once again to Philippians 1, he makes this weird, not that it, weird isn't the right word. I don't never mean that negatively when talking about Paul. But he has this interesting choice. He says, I could depart and be with Christ or I could stay here and work more. And it's almost like he's trying to decide what he's going to have for lunch. I know the stakes are much higher, but that's almost the casualness with which he approaches his own impending execution, which I think is very interesting. So when you look at the way that Paul approaches it, he is the epitome of contentment as he talks about in Philippians chapter 4 loosely. But it doesn't really matter to him what happens to him. If he dies, great. If he stays here, great. He's just, whatever happens to him is okay. And I don't mean that as an emotional state of mind. I think he's talking about it from a choice that he's made. Lee? You know, this, the way you right. Right. It's kind of, and I heard somebody say this, and, and I think there's a great definition. It's a feeling of self-sufficiency. And not in the sense that I am everything that I need, 
but more in the sense of, I have everything I need. And Paul alludes to that if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8. He says, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. If I have the bare necessities of life, I don't really need anything else. And that's a hard position for us sometimes to get to. But as he mentions in verses 9 and 10, some people have kind of moved past that. And they want more and more and more. What's the problem with that? You're never satisfied with it. And this is the, the weird, once again, I don't mean to use that word. This is the, the juxtaposition of this situation, is that if you're content with what you have, you almost always end up having a lot more. And that's where the great gain comes into. But if you desire a lot more, you always end up with a lot less. It's a weird kind of paradox that he has here. Which, once again, begs the question, how is it that great gain plus contentment, or how is it that godliness plus contentment equals great gain? Yeah, show. Right. Exactly. If you are content with the physical things that you have, and I don't mean that we shouldn't strive for more. I'm never saying that ambition is necessarily a bad thing. But if you're content with what you have, and you're living the godly lifestyle and being a Christian the best way that you know how every single day, then you know, as Sandra mentioned, that no matter what happens to you, it's all kind of a, a net positive. And that's not a natural position for a lot of people to be in. But that's the exact same position Paul looked at when he was in prison. The things that I'm going through have actually worked out much better than I thought because I'm viewing it through that lens. There's a lot of ways we could go with this, but I just kind of want to hit the high points. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've heard some people say that, that uh, that's because everything that you have is on loan from God. Right. You own nothing. Everything belongs to God. How you use it is up to you. Right. But either to glorify God or to not glorify God or take care of other people or whatever. Right. These, these all things are things of how you use the gifts that you have from God. Right. Stewardship will kind of be the buzzword for the lesson this morning, but in the same way you're talking about looking at our lives as a stewardship is, I think, a good position to be in because you look at it, as you mentioned, as I'm occupying this place, I've been given these things, it's my responsibility to make the most of them in whatever capacity I can, but then I hand them off to the next guy. You know? And that, that's kind of the idea of stewardship. It's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but it also brings a lot of contentment. Paul? Right. 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 There is a there is a connection, and I didn't think of it a second ago, but you're right in bringing it up. There's a connection here that he makes when he talks about with food and clothing, these we shall be content. He does mention it in I think Matthew chapter six when he talks about the Sermon on the Mount that all these things have been given to you. Don't be anxious for your life. That, I think, is also a connection for Jews in one of the psalms. I can't remember what psalm it is, but one of the psalmists says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen the, the, his people begging for bread. And so it's kind of a, an interesting line when you follow, which is, if all we have is food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Well, as long as you're godly, you'll always have those things. Somehow, God will provide in some way for you. And I don't necessarily mean that he drops manna from heaven out of the sky, but he's certainly capable of that. I think it's almost always seen through his people. So as long as you have these things, you'll be content, but you'll kind of always have those things. You should always, you should always be content. So I, it, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think that's an interesting line to make. Yes. Those with young families are still very young themselves, from what I understand. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, and just to clarify, and I know this isn't what you're saying, that doesn't mean you can't be hopeful about the future. It's just as you talk about, you're kind of looking at all the things you have done, and it's, so it's easier, and maybe I'm so going to turn this, maybe it's easier to be content than at the younger stages of life where you look forward to everything. I think that's kind of what you're driving towards, and I definitely agree with that. But once again, you know, you still see people, and since we're in, I don't know if I'm going to offend anybody with this, but you still see Jerry Jones going after that. What 15th championship? I'm obviously not a Cowboys fan. Why is he pushing towards that? Why are you not happy? Why are you not content? Ambition isn't a bad thing, but you also have to learn that as you grow and as you progress through life, you need to take pleasure in some of the things you've given. And Solomon, it's interesting how when Solomon talks about this, when Solomon in Ecclesiastes decries the nature of excess and how that doesn't really fill the holes inside of you, he also talks at least on three different occasions in Ecclesiastes about the people who are not able to enjoy the things that they have. And the reason that they're not able to enjoy the things they have is, I think, for multiple reasons. One of them that he describes is that you're looking at the next generation as as just kind of wasting it. The other person is not able to enjoy it because they're so obsessed with getting more. And that's where a lot of us find ourselves in, is we look towards where this is going, but we're so busy wrapped up in trying to get more that we don't enjoy what we have. This is a long way of talking about contentment, but I think it's worth looking at too. Paul? Instagram influencer. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of ways I could go into that, but it would probably more dip into pop psychology than anything else. But you're exactly right that we sometimes have idealized versions of ourselves that, when we attain those, aren't really what we make of them, and. You know, now I, I hesitate bringing it up because it's everywhere, but the whole DeMar Hamlin incident this week, I think, taught us that. This is a guy who has everything, and in that moment, everybody became very well aware of what mattered the most. So, yeah. It's interesting to hear somebody who flew at Mach 3 talk about contentment, but it is what it is. But you're, and you're exactly right in everything you said. It is a difficult thing for all of us. Look at what he says right after this in verse 12 or verse 11. He says, and I like how he kind of has this as a practical application to avoiding these temptations. He says, flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and, God, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. When you look at what he says here in verse 11 and 12, he kind of has this do and don't. He says don't, which is the flee, go away from these things, and the do, which is to pursue these things. And I think the reason for that is very practical. If, and sometimes as Christians, we're obsessed with not doing things. And what that creates in us is essentially a desire vacuum. And yes, I did just coin that word. It's a desire vacuum. We're not doing these things, but we're not filling them with things that we need to do. And so when you look at verse 11, flee from these things. Flee from all the selfishness and the greediness and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and godliness. Fight the good fight, fight of faith. So there's an, there's, a, there's an energy that he has. Take all that energy that you would have applied in this direction, remove it, apply it in this direction. I like how he kind of describes that. Verse 13, he says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the command without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and, light, and dwells in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and glory and eternal dominion forever and ever. Amen. The last verse of that, as Paul kind of gets emotional about it, I think is a nice contradiction to what people think about themselves. These are people who are pursuing glory and fame and honor, The only real glory and fame and honor belongs to Jesus and towards God. I think that's what he talks about a little bit there. There's an interesting nugget, though, that he mentions in verse 13, which is when he talks about the good confession, maybe for Pontius Pilate. What is the good confession? Mm 
Because Jesus himself made it standing in front of Pilate. Right. Right. I think there's a lot of truth. Well, of course, there's always truth in what Jesus says. There's a lot of special attention that needs to be paid to the questions that Jesus did answer in his lifetime. Jesus got a lot of questions. He didn't answer most of them. He kind of ignored them or he turned them back on the people. The things that he's asked point blank, sometimes he answers. And that was one of them. I ask you plainly, Pilate says, are you a king? And Jesus says, I am. And you will see, you know, you will see me coming in his kingdom. I'm obviously butchering that. That's the good confession, that Jesus is king. Why is that jammed into a discussion about selflessness and godliness and greediness and all this other stuff? Right. I think saying that about describing who we are kind of comes along with the idea of defining who God is. When we define who God is in our life, then who we are comes as a natural secondary component to that. I think that there's a lot of us sometimes, I mean us and humans as humans, that we just kind of naturally you know, strive for immortality kind of on our own ways. That's why idolatry, I think, is still an issue in some, in some places, is because we're striving for that immortality. The realization that God is king and that we're not is simple, and yet it's life-changing. So I think that's why it's jammed in the middle of this. Keep the commandment without stain. Remember who Jesus is. Then he mentions in verse 17, talking specifically to rich people, he says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Riches are not reliable. That's a hard realization for him, people today to realize. God is reliable. Instruct them, verse 18, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Riches are great, but they're not reliable. And they also don't, as, as he mentions in verse 18, they're not the most important thing. It's much better to be rich in good works than to be rich in financial matters. And that's what he's talking about there in those verses. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Okay, if not, we will pick up next week. Thank you, everybody.